Pardon the interruption, I'm Chris Garrett. Sam, today is National Talk in an Elevator Day. Seriously, um, are you like me? Do you have trouble talking in elevators? Hey Chris, thanks for asking. Normally I'm not the per type of person who likes to talk in elevators a lot, but this really funny thing happened to me today and I can't wait to tell you about it. <laughs> Welcome to PTI, boys and girls. I'm Sam Mulberry. Chris, we are at our last webisode of the year. Wow, it's just flown by. That's right, that's right. So our, in our last webisode, we had students um, write on the discussion boards about faith and science. Uh, what are some of your sort of observations looking at some of those answers? Um, I, I mean, I think hit some notes I probably would have expected the kind of classes they talked about. I think we'd even previewed a little bit on, on Tuesday's webisode. What really strikes me is they're kind of differing opinions about the theme of my science classes didn't talk about God. And some people were totally fine. And I assume they meant not at Bethel, but maybe in high school or if they've been in another college or a community college or something. And some people were fine with that. Like they didn't seem to say intention. You know, they, that seemed appropriate to them. Others were really bothered. Like these, you know, I believe in a creator God. It seems like we ought to deal with it. And, you know, I, I, like, I was thrilled with that response. Like I don't know if creator is an aspect of God we think enough about. Mm -hmm. And in science, and especially a place like Bethel, is a great way to get at that. You know, I, I think as we come out of this modern age unit, I think this is a good place to underscore that the, the modern West and modern America is a plural society, right? In which if it's any kind of public institution or a non-sectarian private institution, I mean, you can't assume that there's shared faith commitment. I think one of my students made that point. It's like, well, if you're going to do that kind of what's called cosmology, well, why would the Christian one be more valid than a billion other cosmologies sure, you sure. might actually have? Now, reading through a couple of your students, um, I mean, one thing that struck me about your response is you kept coming back to the theme of finding God, God in the why. Do you want to explain what you meant? Right. Well, and, and, I, and my big thought about, you know, if you have a, a science course that doesn't sort of explicitly talk about uh, any kind of faith or anything like that, that that's not necessarily meaning it's opposed to that, right? right? Uh, when I look at the, when I think about the sciences, whether it's chemistry, biology, physics, any of any of the, sort of the, the sciences that way, they're really good. And really what they're interested in is processes, right? Like how does this thing happen? What is the process when these chemicals mix? What, what happens in the body? What happens in terms of mechanics and astrophysics and any of those things? They're really interested in the sort of the hows, the processes, right? But what they don't really answer, and I would argue, and this I think I think Galileo is getting at that in, this in, in the essay we read from him is that in reality science isn't really very good at answering the questions about why, yeah. right? That the the methodologies of science that make science science don't really answer why questions very well. So just just because a course doesn't address the whys doesn't mean that it um, doesn't mean that it's saying well. It can't be God or things like that, right? So, so, so I think that's that's part of you know what I see in there, and you know, and for me, I look at religion, and, and I think you know Christianity, whatever faith you're from, really like it's really getting at some of those why questions. Okay, so the world exists, right? Why? Why are we here? How do we interact with, with each other? Those types of things, and then that's where I really think you know, and this is that Galileo reading is really important to me because. He's kind of saying, let's use faith and religion to talk about those things and not these other things. And I think science actually gets into trouble. I think Christianity and faiths in general get into trouble a little bit when they try to use a sacred text like the Bible as a physics textbook, yeah. right? And Galileo talks about that. By that same token, I think the scientists get into trouble when they say, well, we can't really answer the why questions very well. So we're just going to say it's all random chance, which yeah. is then becomes a kind of faith to say, like, well, we're, this is what we, we're going to you know, postulate this, but then we're going to say that's what it is. Like, well, then you have faith in that answer. You didn't use that same scientific method to answer that question. Right. I mean, like, the strongest you could go from that perspective is a kind of probability, right? right. It's just, I mean, as far as we know by empirical observation and testing and theory, it's it's highly unlikely, but you can't actually rule out a supernatural explanation. And so it's the difference between physics in the very oldest sense and metaphysics. Mm -hmm. What struck me about kind of listening to you talk about this is, like, my kids are, are I have five-year-old twins, and they're kind of at that age where why is their favorite question. And it's great. Like, we go to museums, and they love to ask, why does that work? What makes that run that way? And I don't know if that's a natural developmental kind of progression, but it feels like after a while you stop asking questions like that. You, mm -hmm. you kind of get accustomed to the world. You either are very interested in that, or you just lose interest, and it kind of fades in the background. 
And we're me, surrounded by things we can't explain. Exactly. Like, think about your cell phone, right? Like, I don't know how that right, works. Right, it just works, right? But I, I think maybe that's what science is good at, whether it's, you know, very explicitly taught by a Christian professor or not. It, it reintroduces why, it provokes why questions mm -hmm. again. And maybe that drives you back then towards other kinds of things, whether it's theology or scripture or philosophy, uh, things that might give the kind of answers or, or help you to think through answers. Um, so um, as we wrap up with this unit, we, we gave uh, students one last virtual museum about the modern age. And I think it was, a lot of, it was a lot of fun for us, I think, to design, partly because this course used to go all the way into the 20th century. And a few years ago, when Bethel revised its gen ed curriculum, we, we didn't have to. It was kind of like, well, you, you can stop at 1800. And the face-to-face -face course, because we do lectures, stops. But this we felt like, well, why not kind of exit with a fun museum where you know even half the worksheet is just an evaluation of museums and just hear a few things that we're going to go forward into. So Sam, as someone who's been part of CWC mm -hmm. through different iterations, what are you glad we brought back with the Modern Age Museum? There's two things that are not unrelated that I that and, and a lot of it has to do with the 19th century and a little bit of early 20th century, which is, you know, we talk about the scientific revolution and the Enlightenment, and I think to not get into sort of that next wave of important thinkers, the Marx, Darwin, mm -hmm. Nietzsche, Freud, like right. those are kind of essential for, because I feel like if you don't have those, you don't really understand some elements of the world we live in. And it's really a continuation, right? That, that Darwin is swimming in this stream of the thinkers that came before him. And he's kind of pushing some ideas out to a logical, to a logical perspe uh, extent, right? Yeah, I mean, I think if students got their hackles up about the scientific revolution pushing towards disbelief, and it, it's actually because of what happens in the 19th and early 20th. Right, right, because I actually think the Enlightenment, they're, they're trying to they're still trying to hold, hold it all them. together, yeah, and yeah. then it's in the, yeah, in the 19th century, you get people just saying, let's just not, let's just ask, you know, these questions go this direction. So I think that's a big one, and then I actually think, uh, in the same way of thinking of a continuation and of pushing those ideas forward, I just think World War One is really yeah. important because you can think about the French Revolution as like the end of the European Enlightenment mm -hmm. and the way we think about the Age of Reason, but I, World War One is sort of the end of Enlightenment progress and some of those things. I mean, we still have elements of that in the way we look at the world, but like it certainly tests it. as a big as a big scale project. World War One tears the rest of it down. Well, not surprisingly, I think that's true. But I mean, especially what I like is that we brought back a poem that used to be part of the reading packet. Um, uh, w. B. Yeats, uh, "Things Fall Apart," or sorry, but "Things the Fall Second Apart." Coming. The second coming. Yes. "Things Fall Apart" is the famous line from it, and had Barrett Fisher read it. I mean, to me, that's just such a natural point to kind of leave off a course that um, um, has this kind of incredible optimism of progress and instead maybe there's a sense that maybe we've lost any kind of center which in some ways is what Nietzsche is, is kind absolutely of yeah as well I mean they're all speaking to a kind of entropy yeah. right yeah I mean the thing you know, is as if somebody who does European history one thing I'm glad we brought back is some attention to industrialization certainly I mean I think for a lot of us when we think about why is the scientific revolution important it's partly because of the practical application of science and thinking of, well, then we can have technological innovation that's going to enhance productivity and efficiency and create conveniences and make luxuries cheaper. And, you know, that reshapes our world so fundamentally. That, that's a really important thing to, to bring back. Um, so, I mean, I think there are a lot of things there. Um, and I could keep going on. Imperialism is probably the but by that same token, we got to bring a lot of things back. Are there things still missing that it's like, you know, this story really kind of is incomplete because we don't have... Yeah, I mean, I think, too, one that definitely used to be part of CWC, like even my first three years, is we'd have... There were readings on this, and I think there was even kind of a day in class where we talked about 20th century Christianities. Um, and in particular, where did evangelicalism come back in? And um, to some extent, evangelical is still a term that a lot of our students, a lot of our faculty, administrators, trustees, alumni, still it, it describes them. And a part of this course is to help you find kind of where do you fit in the family tree and that's actually a really, really important category. I mean, we kind of touch on it when we talk about pietism and John Wesley and the great Awa First Great Awakening, Second Great Awakening. I mean, that all is part of the story of evangelicalism. But like, like what kind of happens in the second half of the 20th century with Billy Graham and Christianity Today and Fuller Seminary, that, that's really important. That really reshapes Bethel, and that's not really there, but you'll probably encounter it elsewhere. The second thing, we, we talk really briefly about the first African bishop in the Church of England, Samuel Crowther. Um, who's uh, what now would be Nigeria. That's the closest we get to hitting at what in some ways is the most important thing to happen in church history in the 20th century, which is that it becomes really global. Mm -hmm. I just started reading Mark Knoll's new book. Uh, Mark is maybe the greatest American religious historian, Mark Knoll, N-O-L-L. -L. And he was asked to write a memoir about 
kind of his interest in history and what led him from being interested in American and European religious history to recently, he writes about Africa, Asia, and Latin America. And so he talks about in the 20th century, the church moved south, right? And, and so I think one of the limitations of this course is that we do focus so much on Christianity and Western culture, or maybe we call it global Northern culture. If you look at anything since 1900, the most important things happening are happening in Latin America, Asia, and Africa, mm -hmm. and they're totally reshaping. Well, and that actually really interests me because I think about it, it's interesting to think about the um, kind of geography or, or gravitational center of Christianity and how in this course you can you can mark the movement of that to a point because mm -hmm. um, we are following some of the major threads, but not all of it. And there's definitely stories we're not following. Um, but you're right. I mean, to, to to do the 20th century, there's a shift, you know, a major shift, you know, in the same way that the fall of the empire has a shift in terms of how we think about the West, yeah. right? It would be a fascinating thing to put in the museum. Someone, I think it was about 10 years ago, did a, a demographic study of Christianity going back to 3080s, so to death of Christ. And... Um, they essentially plotted what's the demographic center of gravity, like you know, equal amounts north, south, east, and west of this point. And it starts kind of in the Mediterranean, as you'd expect. It's Jerusalem, it's Crete, kind of goes to Greece. And then it kind of moves west you know, into Italy. And by 1900, it's in Madrid, Spain, you know, because a lot of Christians are still in Europe. We also have you know, Latin America, North America. In 1900, sorry, in the next 100 years, it jumps down to Africa and said Mali, and as they project forward to like 2025, it's in Nigeria hmm. somewhere. And that's where the center is because most people in the Christian world are living you know, in the global south in kind of equal parts, Asia, Africa. Okay, um, Sam, so we kind of hint a little bit at where people go with this course. In the Gen Ed curriculum, this is a prerequisite for two other categories, uh, L courses, Contemporary Western Life and Thought, and U courses, World Cultures. Do you want to say a little bit uh, about how CWC connects to either or both of those categories? You have some experience teaching an L course. Sure. You teach the World sure. War I course. Well, I think, I think what the L is doing is really kind of what we talked about. It's picking up where CWC leads off and realizing that where we, leave, where we leave off, whether it's in the face-to-face -face course in 1800 or even kind of pushing into the 20th century a little bit in this course, there's, it's not the end of a story, right? And it's, it's also not a sharp break, but these ideas keep getting pushed forward. So in a course like that, you're going to wrestle with modernity, with modernism, right? With sort of this push that you see from people like Darwin, Freud, Marx, Nietzsche, um, you know, in the West. You're going to have a more of a focus on American history. Um, you're also going to wrestle with some of the big issues of the 20th century, right? Um, which is interesting because increasingly, I mean, we're, we're almost to the point where we are going to have students who weren't alive in the 20th century. We are, I mean, I would guess most of you probably don't remember being alive in the 20th century um, or maybe just barely remember that changeover. But when you look at the 20th century, I mean, you have to wrestle with genocide, the Holocaust, uh, nuclear bombs. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, these are these are big things which... Fundament Cold War, which fundamentally shaped the way um, people, societies, clashes of culture, the way that those things play out. Um, so, I, so that's going to be a big part of the L course. And what I think is, uh, hopefully if a student's paying attention in CWC and in their L, they're going to notice that those things are connected backwards to these other ideas, these other things. So that's what it really excites me. I mean, that's... It's the period of history that I, you know, that I studied and am most interested in. Um, there's also it's also a time of massive migrations, yep. you know, um, both you know immigration to the U.S. I mean, I think that's a story we probably um, a lot of us have heard before. Um, you know, starting, you know, thinking about the 19th century and the 20th century. There's all these different waves from different places, right? But immigration's a lot bigger than that mm -hmm. too. There's just global migrations. Um, uh, for lots of different reasons. And I think that's another big piece of it that sort of to look for in, in, in those courses. Yeah, and, and we've tried to preview a few of those courses in the museum. So, um, for example, this fall, if you're still looking for a course, there's one on history of women in America. If you like the room about the suffrage movement, women's rights, that'd be a great um, thing to pick up. Uh, in the spring, I'm actually teaching a course in World War II, History 231, which is now a course, and we've already mentioned the World War I class that we'll take next in January of 2017. So I'll be looking for that when the study abroad fair happens. I think the U course is we didn't say quite as much, the world culture classes. I mean, I, I think they're really important, though. It just it's a different kind of connection. I mean, I, I think there's an understandable question of why do you do Christianity and Western culture, right? I mean, especially if, like, Christianity now is a global phenomenon where it's happening not in the West. Why, why would you focus on the West? And I think that's actually a good conversation to keep having. 
The best answer I've ever heard to that is, well, you kind of have to start with what most of our students know best. Most of our students come from a Western culture, and, and even if you came from Africa or Asia, you've been influenced by Western culture. And, and a really important developmental skill to learn in your first year in a place like Bethel is, how do you stand apart from that culture? How do you critique it? How do you appreciate it? You know, that, that's not an easy thing to do if you've been immersed Well, in how it. do you even understand that you're in a culture, right? right? What is a culture? And so in some ways, I mean, you, you kind of have to do that work before you can then dive into, for most of us, a radically other kind of culture and immerse yourself in peoples and cultures of Africa in the anthropology department or minorities in America in the history department or, of course, in Islamic thought or Asian thought or something. It, I think it'd be really hard to do if you hadn't put in the work of, can I do this with something I know well before I go jump in with something I don't know well at all. And I think those courses also help you critique back uh, American culture, right? Western culture. Yeah. I think it, it helps you ask some different questions, and it also, and I think it gives you a toolkit for valuing yes. things in culture and evaluating things. So, Chris, uh, we're sort of on the um, right on the precipice before uh, the third exam, and then the final assignment. Can you talk a little bit about what to expect from that? Or? Sure. So, I don't think we have anything more to say about how to take a test. You've done this twice. It'll be very similar structure uh, on the third exam. So that'll be Monday. You'll have the same kind of four-hour window in which to start and you'll have 75 minutes to finish. Um, what we'll do then is on Tuesday, we'll post the last of our films, which points, in some ways looks back, points forward. Um, if you want to take a day off, that's fine. You, you can watch that Tuesday, you can watch it Wednesday. You do have one last assignment though, a five question exit interview that'll be on Moodle, and that's due Thursday morning. So you've got a couple of days to think about this. Um, it's, it's a variety of questions. Some of them are kind of more stepping back, evaluating, synthesizing course materials. Some of them are more like personal reflection questions at, at this point. Um, you know, in some ways, we'd rather sit down face to face with you and do this, but probably the easiest, most convenient way is we just put five questions up in the Moodle format. You type in your answers, and we give you a word limit to give you some constraints. Yeah, I think the big thing with that is, you know, take some time to. Uh, I, I, well, my recommendation would be read those questions and don't start typing or writing right away. Yeah. Like, take some time to process the question because really that's what we're that's what we're looking for a lot is you know is some reflection on what we've looked at, but also how that connects to you, how that changes the way you think or affirms the way you think or challenges the way you think. You know, that's really, really what we're looking for in that. So, so I think taking those questions seriously and taking your time with them, I think, is really the big thing. Yeah, look back over previous assignments, especially I think the responses you've done to films and readings will probably connect directly with some of these questions. Um, I mean, it has the same kind of expectations, I guess, for writing as those responses. You know, there's a certain word count. We do expect a certain degree of polish here, unlike with, you know, the discussion boards are a little bit more, you know, off the cuff. This should reflect some thought, some deliberation, some editing, um, and it's kind of your last chance to, to offer some reflections before you say goodbye for the summer. All right, welcome to our last chance to play Food Chain. Uh, I think the tension, Sam, was palpable on this because entering competition here today, we are tied two to two. This is winner take all, all the marbles, whatever cliche you want to throw out there. Now, I should point out, so far, Sam has won Make the Case each time we've done it. I've won Food Chain each time we've done it. And I don't know if I'm kind of setting myself up for failure here. It's well, sort of a home game, game for you. Yeah, it feels that way. So what we're going to do is uh, Food Chain about Unit 3. Now, we are going to make things just a little bit easier and say that this is kind of scientific revolution up through 1800. You know, we throw in some 19th, early 20th century terms, but honestly, if we stretch it out that far, it, it's going to get utterly ridiculous. So we can maybe talk about that after we put up our list. But let me kick us off with my top five most significant individuals from the history of Christianity and Western culture from the scientific revolution up until around the year 1800. So I'm going to start with uh, the Polish astronomer Copernicus. Now, part of me wants to say, like, of all the scientific years, he's in some ways maybe not that significant, right? I mean, it really takes Galileo to, uh, and, and then we'll talk about Newton in a second, really to develop what he's doing. But since last time on here, I talked about how important it was that there has been an individual to get the ball rolling, and I put Martin Luther at the top of our Unit 2 list, I'm going to have to say the same thing about Copernicus. You could say that a scientific revolution was bound to happen, but it hadn't happened until that point. And I'm always really taken by the story of how Copernicus waits until he's virtually on his deathbed to very tentatively offer this hypothesis that maybe actually the sun is at the center of the universe not the earth. And he, he writes this very famous preface to, uh, to the Pope trying to explain he's doing this as a good Catholic, as an official of the church. He knows it's a turbulent time in the middle of the Reformation, wars of religion are in the offing, and yet he still feels 
conscience bound, as Luther would say, to propose it. So I think he's a significant figure in launching a revolution. We'll come back to another scientist in a second. I'm going to say number four is John Wesley. Now, if this were just significant in Western culture, I might not say this, but because it is significant in Christianity in Western culture, and because this will seem like a fairly secular list befitting the modern age, I think Wesley, if I had to pick one religious revivalist from this period, he, he really stands out to me. Now, we could talk about the Pietists here, we could talk about Edwards or Whitfield, uh, we could talk about deism here for that matter. I'll say Wesley probably because he's got the great story, which I think is an essential for being on lists like these. Um, he introduces so many things that we just take as commonplace. You know, he popularizes the small groups that the Pietists have started to experiment with. The notion of kind of going out into any place and preaching, and maybe going outside of established church systems, of partnering across denominations, of thinking a lot about what Christianity means for ordinary people's vocations. I just think in so many ways, he really sets the stage for, for modern expressions, at least of Protestant Christianity. And then the final thing I'll say is that he is the one who initiates a kind of movement that culminates not just with Methodism, which is really an important movement in American history and other, other places, but eventually he gives birth, his descendants, to Pentecostalism, as we talked about a little bit in the, in the last museum. And arguably, that's the most important, fastest growing movement in world Christianity around the globe. There's a lot of explanation for number four. I don't know if I'm overcompensating here. Number three, we'll stay in England with Johns and talk about John Locke here. There, there's so many things you could say. We, we tried to talk about a couple of them. Social contract theory, he has obvious influence on democratic revolutions, especially in the United States. Um, a couple of you did pick up on his psychology, which is that human beings are born as a tabula rasa, a blank slate, that we, we don't have preconceptions, we're not born with sin or with virtue, but we take it in from our environment. That's important, whether you agree with it or disagree, it's an important theory. The final thing I'll add here is that religious toleration and religious pluralism obviously are key themes as we move into the modern age. We've talked a lot about Voltaire here, the deist Ben Franklin. John Locke is actually a forerunner there, too. He writes a very famous letter urging religious toleration in England in the 1690s. So for all those reasons, he's really setting off a lot of important themes in the modern age. Number two, we'll go almost up into our deadline and talk about Mary Wollstonecraft. I've, I've tried to always find uh, a place to talk about women in this course, because as many of you have noted in your reflections, they tend to be fairly silent because of the nature of the political and the economic and social and religious systems being so patriarchal. I mean, here you've got the birth of feminism. And uh, you know, in her time, I don't know if anyone would have, would have said Mary Wollstonecraft was this significant. And this is one of these things where the influence has to work its, its way out. but. In terms of articulating the idea that women actually possess full dignity, full capacity for reason, ought to be full citizens in political senses, ought to have uh, access to, for example, universities like this one, I always especially think of that last idea, women ought to be educated, is, is you know, what to us seems commonplace. I mean, 60% of the Bethel population is women. At her time, that's revolutionary and scandalous, and, and so I think she's just enormously important for that reason. But again, for consistency's sake, last, podcast, last episode I was up here talking about how Newton is bigger than Jesus, according to one person who ranks these things. So I think I have to stick with Isaac Newton here. I mean, I just think, as I looked at the last museum and these pieces of modern mental furniture, it, it really starts, I don't know if this was number one or not, but it really starts with Newton. This notion that there are actually laws of nature that are, are universal, discoverable, accessible to reason, predictable, and can be harnessed and might actually also run through human interactions. You know, this is going to be challenged then by Einstein in the 20th century in the world of physics, but in terms of um, setting up the structure of modernity, I think really Newton is, is the place that starts and stops. Sam, what do you think? Well, I like your list a lot. Um, what we're going to notice this time around is that you and I are going to have a lot of similar, um, a lot of similar people on here. I think the order is going to be uh, going to be a little bit different, but um, yeah. So I'm going to I'm going to reserve saying too much because I'm going to have some similar people on my list, and I'm going to want to unpack that a little more. And number five on my list is one that I'm going to admit is a bit of a reach, and that is Blaise Pascal. I talked about Pascal in the last episode. Um, for me, Pascal is it's just really such an important figure for both connecting to the scientific revolution, knowing what that means, and also trying to think about, trying to hold on to some place for faith in that as well. In fact, I think a lot of the conversation that we had at the beginning of this webisode, when we were talking about the, the hows in science and the whys in faith, 
I think a lot of that you can find in Pascal, right? He talks about the different ways that we know things. We know things through reason. We know things through the heart. Um, and I think Pascal is really a, really a central, important figure. He's a very important figure for me, so I want to make sure to have him on this list. Number four on my list is Aludo Equiano. Um, <clears throat> a lot of you wrote uh, uh, in your um, response to Equiano sort of about the kind of the horrors of slavery and the, the weird paradox that at the you know this time of, of European enlightenment that we have all of these big really all of these big European empires and 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 America sort of standing on a foundation of racialized slavery right and Equiano is really important because one of the things that he does is he writes a book right he writes a book and this is what we read excerpts from where you know it's at one level he's really kind of unmasking and and showing people this is what the slave trade looks like this is what the Middle Passage looks like. Right? There's a big push. We talk about William, William Wilberforce. There's a big push to end the slave trade um, in England and other places. And that does happen with politicians right? because it's an act of law. But it's people like Equiano who put human faces onto that by telling his own story and the, sto- and the stories of, um, of other enslaved peoples. And I think that is such an important thing because slavery is sort of the, one of the big horrors of this time period that we're looking at. And Equiano plays such an important role in unmasking that and bringing that to public public consciousness and then helping to bring about the end of it. All right, at number three, I'm going to put John Wesley. And I agree with all the stuff that Chris said, so I'm not going to reiterate that. One other point that I would make that I think is really important in terms of Wesley, I mean, Wesley comes to America before he has his pietistic conversion. He's kind of a failed missionary to the American colonies, but he might be one of the most important people to American Christianity at the same time, not just because of Pentecostalism, but because of the Methodist movement. If you were to look at the 19th century, Methodist circuit preachers are the people who bring revival to the American frontier, right? There aren't churches as people continue to go west. So the, the, the Methodists set up this system of circuit preachers where preachers would ride around to bring revival to these places who didn't maybe have local churches, things like that. So that's all growing out of Wesley's movement and his idea about conversion. So Wesley is just monumentally important. Number two, I'm going to put John Locke. Uh, Again, for all of the reasons that Chris said, I think his ideas, uh, particularly about, um, about sort of understanding political realities, understanding where governments come from, the justification for political revolution, taking government and saying, this is really about the consent of the governed, this is about these natural rights. I think these are really core ideas to how we think about government, but also how we think about human beings, right? We think about these natural rights. So Locke is really, really important. Now, what I find interesting is Locke publishes some of these important texts in 1688. In 1687, my number one person, Isaac Newton, publishes his Principia. So if you bought a copy of, now that's what I call Science and Philosophy, 1687, 1688, like you'd get both of their works, so that would be a really exciting book to buy if that existed. Number one is Newton. Um, for all the reasons Chris said, and, and this is what I would add to thinking about Newton, is Newton is one of those people who really as an individual, and, and now Newton will acknowledge that he is standing on the shoulders of the people who came before him, right? That he's standing on the shoulders of Galileo and Tycho Brahe and Copernicus and Kepler and, and, and Aristotle, right? All of these people, right? He's standing on their shoulders. But Newton fundamentally changes the world, fundamentally changes the way we understand the world, right? We sometimes hear this, the, the term paradigm shift, you know, brought about when things change. This is a paradigm shift, right? Like, this is fundamentally rethinking how the world works. We talked about science being good at hows. Newton was probably the best at hows, right? He's, the world is different, and it it pushes other people to have to ask different questions and even come up with different methods for giving answers to those questions. So I think we both agree, if we're looking at this time period, Newton casts a shadow, I mean, over this whole time period. He's basically at the, pretty much at the beginning of the Enlightenment, right? He, he puts a cap on the scientific revolution and creates the Enlightenment all in one fell swoop. Okay, well, I have to say, when I first looked at our list, I thought, well, where can you go with this? And we actually end up in very similar places. Uh, you know, I love that you've got Equiano on here. I mean, of all the terms we've added in the last five years, I think this is one of the most important. Because slavery is not only the original sin of, of the American Republic, it's the original sin of the Enlightenment in many mm-hmm. ways, too. 
And it's also important to note that Equiano's book, we give you little excerpts, it, it's actually a spiritual memoir. It's his conversion story. It harkens back to Augustine mm-hmm. and the Confessions in, in many respects and reminds us that Christianity began as an African religion and as we've hinted already, it's moving that way as we go further along. Sam, if we had to add one more to our list, who do you think you have had as number six? I really struggled. I, I, I like, I, I'm, I'm, I'm convinced by my argument about paradigm shifts. So I was trying to think of what are other big paradigm shifts that we saw. You know, I, I thought about putting Adam Smith on here because because he's shifting. What Locke does for government, Smith kind of does for uh, for economics. I think what Locke is doing is a probably a bigger thing, and and I, I think Adam Smith, if he hadn't done it, somebody else would have been for making that argument. So he was he was one that was sort of you know one of the first people out for me. Yeah, I mean it's significant though. I mean I think most of us probably assume well, capitalism is something Christians have always been comfortable with. It, it's it's not up until this point. It's and then when you read Adam Smith, it's pretty challenging as yeah. a Christian to say, how great. do I feel about that? Yeah. fantastic. Yeah. Um, I mean, if I were going to try to think a little more creatively, I, I notice a lot of English people on here. I might add Bartolome de las Casas for a couple of reasons. First. We've got a colleague, Ruben Rivera, who always wants to remind us Latin America is really part of the West. And, and um, you really an interesting intersection of kind of Western culturally captive Christianity with indigenous ways of expressing it. I think the other thing that's really important about De Las Casas is he's giving us a model of what it looks like to do a kind of faithful critique of, uh, of Christendom, if not Christianity itself. Someone who is deeply committed to the Christian missionary project. He's so thrilled that here we've got this whole new field out there and the harvest is plentiful and yet it's all being undone because the supposedly Christian economic and political regime is behaving just monstrously. And I think like as we talk about this course equipping you to look at culture critically, that's a really important model. And you know, it kind of points the way towards like Martin Luther King and Larry from Birmingham. Jail. Right, I think it's very similar to what we see in Wollstonecraft and Equiano where Las Casas is using Christianity and the lenses of Christianity to critique Christians just as Equiano is doing. Yeah. And, and, and Wollstonecraft and Equiano are using the, the lenses of the Enlightenment to critique the Enlightenment project. And I think that's um, that's, a, that's a really valuable perspective to be able to bring. Okay, so it's a tough choice, very similar list, but important differences. Please, re- please register your opinion. This is the deciding factor, so we'd like to have everyone vote on this. Uh, do we have a deadline to set for them? Or? Uh, uh, let's say <laughs> by the exam. By the exam time, and we'll announce who wins this, because I know you're going to be waiting with bated breath for those results. Okay, one last time. It's happy, happy time. Happy birthday to author J.K. Rowling, 50 years old today. Sam, you've been reading the Harry Potter books with your kids. You've watched all the movies. What is your favorite, I'll say, book or movie from the Harry Potter right, And I have to say, I never, I've never read these before. I have saw the movies. I actually fell asleep during most of the movies, so I really don't know what happens, except for the last one I stayed awake during, which kind of ruined some stuff. Um, so I'm sort of late to the party on this because I keep reading these and telling people, you know what's really great are these Harry Potter books. So it's like, welcome to 1999 or whatever, <laughs> right? Um, I really liked the uh, the third book, which is The Prisoner of Azkaban. I really liked that. I just started the fourth book, so I, um, I think it seems like that's the like the first two books are pretty similar, and then the third book it takes some turns in some different directions, and I. I'm, I'm really enjoying that, although the fourth book's really good so far. Sure, yeah. This well, just in. We'll just keep checking back with you on that. I mean, what I mean, is, I mean, like, we're talking about when to start reading, like, Chronicles of Narnia to our kids right now. I don't think they're quite ready for Harry Potter. Like, give some parenting advice. At what point is it appropriate for, I mean, where, where do you think they start to really appreciate it? If, if I'm being honest, like, if you wait entirely until they're ready, uh-huh. you'll never do it now, right? So, and I, I mean, this is generally, you know, uh, sort of a thought with parenting. Like, you want to sort of, protect them from from certain things or things that are going to scare them but you also sort of want to challenge them a little bit and push them a little bit so uh we did the first book in the first movie i can't remember what age that was with harry potter but then it was clearly they were so hungry for it that it's like i started to value okay well i know what happens in you know in this book and you know this character dies or this happens or this happens and i realized like you know my kids have seen star wars like <laughs> They saw that pretty young, so that uh, so have your kids seen Star Wars? Is the question? No, they've not. They're, they're scared by um, cars. Ah, 
and Toy Story. Those are scary for our kids. <laughs> That's another conversation. All right. <laughs> a happy anniversary, Michael Phelps. On this day in 2012, you set the record for most Olympic medals. Chris, can we get an early preview of the swimming competition for Rio 2016? Sam, I know you're expecting me to talk about Missy Franklin. Is she going to build on the five medals she won in London in 2012? Or is Cesar Cielo? Is he going to bring home gold as a native Brazilian in Rio in his home pool? What I want to talk about is the headline today. There is raw sewage. The water is off real. I'm just glad that this is in what I assume is a sanitized, fully chlorinated natatorium. Not in one of the three sites where there is, again, raw sewage floating around. So I think there's all sorts of drama looming in Rio 2016 that I can't wait to see. I feel I, like we're breaking news to some people. I, I feel bad. For, I assume it's like sailing sites or like the canoeing or kayaking sites. Is it, I mean, is there like a long distance, like offshore swimming competition? I don't think so. Maybe the volleyball is is on the beach right by the water. Yeah, that's dangerous. So if there's like a, you know, somebody overhits the ball, they have to go into the sewage. I, I, I should make, it's, it's a serious, like, this, yeah, like having safe water to drink and to be, is actually a serious problem in Brazilian society and has to do with like um, urbanization, overcrowding. So I don't want to make light of it, but it does make me wonder how the Rio games are going to go in 2016. Okay, finally, happy trails to these webisodes. Sam, we're almost near the end of this third season of CWC, the radio, uh, the webisode. <laughs> What's been your favorite moment from this summer? You want a, a favorite moment? You want to highlight, Love Chris? I'm going to do you one better. Okay. Roll the clip. Shine! 